um, when you analyze the making of a nation, it's making of an organization, making of a nation. One of the first few things we do is a SWOT analysis. We do strengths, we do weaknesses, we do opportunities, and we do threats. Any making of an organization or a nation. I thought, let me put across to you, what is the SWOT analysis of making of a nation, let's say, Bharat, India? What are the strengths of India? What are the weaknesses of India? What are the opportunities we have? And what are the threats we need to? Let's first look at the strengths of India. I would uh, bring it down further to an individual. What is needed to build a successful individual? The same things are needed to build a successful nation. Right. It's not any different. Yes. <laughs> if one knows how to build a successful human being of himself in every way, when I say successful, not that just you made money, not just that you get a ranking, not just that you got elected, no. A successful human being means in every way you're complete. If you make this, you the same replica is for the nation in the sense, if you want to be a good human being, to start with all your four limbs should be limbered up and nice, strong and Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. The four limbs of a nation is just this, the executive, the judiciary, the military and the civil services, all of them must be limbered up and agile. They, we must do some yoga with all of them. We must need them. They've all become, you know, if you can't fold your elbow, your elbow is stuck here, your this thing is stuck here, these are useless limbs. When you have pain in your limbs, you will wish you did not have those limbs, isn't it? <laughs> That's what is happening right now. Absolutely. We wish we did not have them many times because they've become such a pain. So keeping them limbered up, these four limbs is very important. See, always a nation will be successful only when people's aspirations are kept alive. If people lose their aspiration, it's a finished nation, okay? There must be enormous aspiration and people should see a piece of the sky. They must see it's a possibility, it is not an empty dream. If it becomes an empty dream, they'll go to hallucinogenic drugs. They must see a piece of the sky that it's worth making the effort always. So to nurture an aspiration and to create the possibility that within your lifespan you can get there is very important. And also make people's aspiration into national aspiration and nation's aspiration into people's aspiration. And a strategic sense as to where we are, is not living in an utopian idea of well-being, which we have done <laughs> unfortunately, having a strategic sense of where we are, what are the things to make a nation happen. For example, when we made the nation, this is not a, a commentary on some mistakes that people might have done because in retrospect we can say many things. In those times they did what I believe they did whatever they thought was best. For example, we have been trading with the rest of the world for over ten thousand years. If you go to Syria in many parts of Arabia, particularly Syria unfortunately it's in such a mess, I wanted to do this Indian trading route, the Indian traders, how they travel, so I drove through Syrian de desert by myself and we went. It was a fantastic thing, experience. Wherever you go, stories of Indian traders eight thousand years ago, the Aleppo, Aleppo city which is completely in rubble right now, one of the most beautiful cities, was built only on the taxes that the Indian traders paid, okay. Everywhere in the Syrian schools they're studying about how Indian traders and engineers and all kinds of people coming eight, ten thousand years ago. Is there any such story in India? Do you know? No Indian child ever reads about it. Yes. You go to Lebanon, there's a place called Baalbek, which is a four thousand three hundred year old Phoenician temple. Every child in fifth, sixth standard in Lebanon, in school, they all study that Indian builders, Indian sculptors, Indian elephants, Indian labor and Indian yogis came and built this. A huge massive temple, each stone, some of the foundations were stones weighing three hundred tons, they transported up the mountain and built this, Indian engineers of that time. You have lotus flowers hanging from the ceiling. Obviously there are no lotuses in Lebanon. It was sculpted by the Indian sculptors. Every Lebanese child knows this. Does any Indian child, any of the Indians have they heard about it? No. Over a thousand years ago, Tamil kings went to Angkor Wat and Angkor Thom. Yes. If any of you, most… many of you might have seen this, 
you will feel proud of being human if you see the work that's been done. It's the largest religious building on the planet, I'm Kortong. Does any Tamil child in Tamil Nadu up to twelve standard read a line about it in his textbook? No. When you don't build pride, how do you build a nation? If you do not build pride, you cannot build a nation. If you are not proud of who you are, why the hell should you stay here? Right now, if the more advanced countries, western countries open up their visa policy, eighty percent of the Indians will swim across the oceans and go away. <laughs> that means if eighty percent of the people want to go away and you're holding them by force, it's a prison. You know about prisons <laughs> We're holding them. No, people should want to be here. Everybody wants to go away and we're holding them. That's not the way to run a nation. So is that your main weakness from strength? Strength is healthy people, inspired people. Yes. Is your weakness is… Un it it is a serious weakness in the country. Rootless people. You're talking about people who have no roots. They don't understand their roots, they don't understand their history. They, they don't understand their culture, it is not their the, No, they're not rootless people, they're root. They know their roots but they're little ashamed of their roots, they're hiding their roots and they're all wearing denim pants just Sadhguru, to hide their roots. Sadhguru, they don't know their roots. <laughs> Sadhguru, that's a fact, they don't know their roots. They may I, not… No, no, in our schools which we run, many of the ninth standard, tenth standard coming from different kinds of schools, primarily government-funded schools. First thing which one of my director, teacher said, can you write on an essay on Mahatma Gandhi? Sadhguru, you'd be shocked to hear, I'm talking of only of Gandhiji. The essay said, and the question was, what is the, what's the name of the wife of Mahatma Gandhi? Do you know one of them wrote? Can you guess? I don't even want to mention the name. Don't tell me. So, so Sadhguru, Sadhguru, they, you, you can go just now, what's wrong with us? So that's our weakness you're talking about, it's rootless. I, I would like to repeat this, we are not rootless, but people who occupied us for so long somehow managed to bring a certain sense of shame about our roots, which is… which has to go. See, Mahatma Gandhi is a part of a, a movement which is not even history, which I would call it present, okay? It's just the back end of our present stage. He's not really history that way. He's, he's still so close to us in time, I'm yes, saying. Of course. All I'm saying is, uh, this is… Picking up names, this, that is different, but everybody knows Mahatma Gandhi's face and everybody knows uh, he was important for our nation, that much even a village child knows it, which is I feel all right. But I'm talking about a much deeper thing that is as a land, as a people, what are we good at? Have we been good at something? No. We've been only occupied for thousand years, we've been looted, we've been raped, we've been robbed. This is all we've done. We've done nothing that's worthwhile, that's not good. We have to educate our children to show that we have done tremendous things. Just two hundred and fifty years ago, we were the largest economy, whole of Europe was thirsting to come to India and even, you know, wherever they went, they called people Indians, <laughs> whether they went to North America or wherever, because they were all aspiring to come to this place, because it was the wealthiest nation, it was the most knowledgeable country, it was the best place to be. Everybody wanted to be here. Who teaches them? Who teaches these youngsters? These things have not been taught because our Who history has been written by… Who is at fault? Because our books are written by the English, okay? The history is written like this to dominate you. No, but it's NCRT. <laughs> it's no Say, more English writers, it, no, it's Indian no. writers. You bring but, yoga in… <coughs> but your brains are in Greenwich Mean Time. You ask anybody, I see on the news channels, in the, among the ministers, everybody talking, okay, I, I was in Cambridge in this year, where, where were you? I was in Oxford. Uh, only now I'm seeing people who studied locally seem to be somewhere. <laughs> you, you will see, this is the pride. Okay, I went to Cambridge, where did you go? Oh, I was in Oxford, okay? Recently I will tell you how it is. I was in Hyderabad, a journalist wants to interview me and uh, she's telling me a piece of information. It seems the Sheffield University in UK made a study on the vibrations of the sun and they measured these vibrations, they're exactly the same vibrations 
which will happen when you utter the sound Aam. She said, Sadhguru, you must say this. I said, I will not say this. I am not going to say this. I have been telling you for thirty years, many yogis and mystics have been telling you for thousands of years and it's not valuable. Sheffield University tells you it's valuable, I am not going to… I don't need authentication <laughs> It works for me. You just look at me, it's worked hundred percent, okay? It's worked, everything that we do and the sciences of this nation, the essential aspect of what the Sanskrit is has worked brilliantly well for us for thousands of years and we know it works, we don't need any authentication. But right now we have created a world unless it's authenticated by the West. Even the yoga that you're doing here is only reborn from the American coast. People… <laughs> people think yoga was invented by Madonna. I recall in the prison assignment when I brought in yoga as a part of… part of the day's regime, many p persons of certain communities and certain people didn't want to do it. They thought it is linked with… with a particular faith till their own teachers came and explained to them that this is for your larger good, it's mind, body, soul in… in harmony. How do you dispel this? See, if, uh, this is what I want to tell you. For thousands of years, we've been the biggest traders, okay, from this country. The largest exports were from India for almost many thousands of years. Nobody ever thought of exporting in such large quantities. So both with goods and gods, we've been very good. Okay? We can export both, we don't have to import either. <laughs> We're very good both with goods and gods. Our ability to create goods was systematically broken. Our industry was broken, our business systems were broken. It's all right. We, I'm not complaining, we let it happen because… We let it happen because we did not take care of one of the limbs. There was no military wing. Military wing. Yeah. When… when in invaders came, That's you right. could not defend your people. That's right. Because you were singing music, you were meditating, you were doing things. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Nice, you were in mathematics, you were in astronomy, you were all this. And they were not united either. Uh, You're not united. You were… there were so many, they were fighting each other. That is also there. But I'm saying essentially you didn't have the martial yes. power… Yes. …to defend yourself. Correct. Correct. 